Have you ever wondered if there's a secret knowledge that can lead you to a deeper understanding of God? Well, there was a group of people who thought exactly that. They were called the Gnostics, and their beliefs have been labeled as one of the earliest forms of Christian heresy. The Gnostics believed they were privy to a special secret knowledge about God, a knowledge that was hidden from the rest of humanity. This knowledge, they claimed, was the key to salvation, a sort of spiritual cheat code. Sounds intriguing, right? But here's where things get a little unusual. Gnosticism is based on a concept called dualism. Now, when we talk about dualism in the context of Gnosticism, we're not talking about the good and evil, light and dark kind of dualism. We're talking about a more fundamental division, a split between the spiritual and the physical. Gnostics believe that the spiritual realm was pure and perfect while the physical world was inherently flawed and corrupt. The God who created our physical world, they claimed, was a lesser deity, a flawed maker. The true God, the perfect God, resided in the spiritual realm. Imagine for a second, living in a world where the physical is seen as corrupt and the spiritual as the only true reality. It's a perspective that flips our conventional understanding of existence on its head, isn't it? But wait a minute. How does this ancient belief system, this Gnostic way of thinking, tie into our lives today? Is there a reason we should care about a heretical belief from over 2,000 years ago? Absolutely. Because understanding Gnosticism isn't just about digging into the dusty corners of church history. It's about understanding the many ways that our perceptions of God, our spiritual beliefs, and our worldviews can be twisted and distorted. Let's dive into the murky waters of this ancient belief system and see what it's all about. Gnosticism didn't just pop up overnight, it has a fascinating and complex origin story. To understand Gnosticism, we need to dive deep into the early years of Christianity where it first took root. This was a time when the fledgling faith was still defining its doctrines and beliefs, and a time when philosophical ideas of the era had a significant influence. Gnosticism has its roots entwined with the philosophy of Plato. This ancient Greek philosopher postulated that the world was divided into the realm of the ideal and the realm of the physical, the perfect and the imperfect. Gnostics adopted this dualistic perspective, seeing the world as a battleground between the spiritual and the material. In their view, the spiritual was pure and perfect, while the material, physical world was corrupt and flawed. This viewpoint was further developed in the cosmopolitan milieu of the Greco-Roman world. The ancient Mediterranean was a melting pot of cultures and ideas, a place where philosophical concepts could cross-pollinate and evolve. Here, the Gnostic belief system took on a distinctly mystical flavor. Gnostics came to believe that divine knowledge or gnosis could liberate the spiritual self from the material world. This gnosis was not just intellectual knowledge, but a profound, transformative understanding. The Gnostics saw themselves as part of a spiritual elite privy to secrets that the uninitiated could not comprehend. They claimed to possess a higher knowledge, a special revelation that went beyond the teachings of the mainstream Christian church. To them, the God of the Old Testament was a flawed lesser deity, a creator who had botched the job. The true God, they believed, was a remote, unknowable entity, far removed from the world of matter. Gnosticism was not a single unified doctrine. Instead, it was a diverse and sometimes contradictory mix of beliefs. Different Gnostic sects had their own interpretations, their own texts, and their own rituals. What united them was the belief in Gnosis as the key to salvation and the conviction that the material world was fundamentally flawed. The Christian church in its early years was still defining its doctrines and beliefs. It was a time of intense debate and disagreement, a time when different interpretations of the Christian message were competing for followers. In this context, Gnosticism emerged as a major challenge to the emerging Orthodox Christian faith. Gnosticism's dualistic worldview and its emphasis on secret knowledge were at odds with the teachings of the mainstream church. For the church fathers, God was not a distant, unknowable entity, but a loving creator who had revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. Salvation was not a matter of secret knowledge, but of faith, repentance, and love. But despite the church's resistance, Gnosticism found a following. Its teachings resonated with many people in the Greco-Roman world who were drawn to its mystical vision and its promise of liberation from the material world. For a time, it seemed that Gnosticism might even become the dominant form of Christianity. 
And so, Gnosticism was born, but its journey was far from over. The struggle between Gnosticism and Orthodox Christianity would shape the future of the Church, leading to heated debates, bitter conflicts, and eventually, the formulation of the Christian creeds, but that's a story for another day. For now, we can say that Gnosticism, with its complex origins and its radical reinterpretation of Christian teachings, represents a fascinating chapter in the history of Christianity, a chapter that still has much to teach us today. Gnosticism wasn't simply a quiet philosophical debate, it was a major thorn in the side of the early church. Picture this, a fledgling institution trying to establish itself, and then along comes a gnarly gnosis, challenging the very foundation of its beliefs. Gnosticism, with its emphasis on secret knowledge and the material world's rejection, was not just a contrasting viewpoint. It was a formidable contender that pushed the early church to define and defend its teachings. This was not a mere disagreement over the color of the church's drapes. This was a full-scale intellectual wrestling match where the stakes were the hearts and minds of believers. The Gnostics did not believe in the crucifixion's salvific power. They believed that salvation came from within, from the realization of the divine spark in oneself. This was a radical departure from the church's teachings where salvation came through faith in Christ's sacrifice. In response, the church had to clarify its position on key doctrines like Christ's nature and the path to salvation. The church had to say, hold up, we've got some significant disagreements here. Let's hash this out and hash it out. They did. This led to the formation of various councils like the Council of Nicaea in 325, which laid down concrete creeds to combat Gnostic teachings. These creeds were not just religious documents, they were the church's intellectual line in the sand, a clear demarcation of what it stood for. The Apostles' Creed, for instance, was a direct response to Gnostic teachings, affirming the physical world's goodness. The Nicene Creed, too, was a rebuttal to Gnosticism, affirming Christ's full divinity and humanity. The Church's fight against Gnosticism was not just about intellectual superiority or doctrinal purity, though. It was about protecting the faith of its flock. The Church was saying, hey, we've got your spiritual back. We're not going to let these Gnostic ideas lead you astray. The struggle with Gnosticism also helped the Church to sharpen its pastoral care. It realized the need for better catechesis, better teaching of the faith, to prevent believers from being drawn into Gnosticism's attractive but misguided teachings. Gnosticism may have been branded a heresy, but its influence didn't end there. It forced the Church to articulate its beliefs, to defend its teachings, and to deepen its pastoral care. It was a thorn in the side, yes, but it was also a catalyst for growth. So, while Gnosticism may have lost the battle, its impact on the early church was profound and lasting. You may be surprised to know that Gnosticism is alive and well in modern society. In our exploration of Gnosticism, we've journeyed through its origins and early impact, but what about now? What place does this ancient heresy have in our contemporary world? Well, let's dive into that. Gnosticism, with its focus on hidden knowledge and individual enlightenment, has found its way into various corners of modern spirituality and religious thought. Its influence can be seen in the rise of what some may call cafeteria-style spirituality, where elements of different religions and philosophies are picked and chosen to create a personalized spiritual path. This mirrors the Gnostic approach where the individual's quest for knowledge is paramount. The New Age movement, for instance, shares many similarities with Gnosticism. It emphasizes a direct personal experience of the divine, often bypassing traditional religious structures and dogmas. The idea of a divine spark within all of us waiting to be realized is a key component of New Age thinking, and you guessed it, it's a Gnostic idea too. But it's not just in the New Age movement where we see Gnosticism's fingerprints. Some interpretations of Christianity today bear a striking resemblance to Gnostic thought, for instance, the prosperity gospel, which teaches that faith guarantees worldly success and wealth, is a sort of Gnostic materialism. It promises secret knowledge for personal gain, a key element of Gnostic belief. Even in popular culture, Gnosticism has a role to play. Ever watched The Matrix? The film's concept of the world as an illusion and the protagonist's journey to enlightenment through hidden knowledge is Gnostic to its core. And let's not forget about the self-help industry. The promise of transformation through knowledge and the potential for an individual to reach a higher state of existence is a tune that Gnosticism has been humming for centuries. Despite its ancient origins, Gnosticism is far from a relic. It's a living, breathing part of our modern world. 
influencing our spirituality, our culture, and even our self-perception. But here's the catch. While Gnosticism might seem appealing, even progressive, it carries with it the same pitfalls that made it a heresy in the first place. It promotes a subjective truth based on personal experience, undermining the communal universal truth that traditional religions like Christianity uphold. It promises a shortcut to enlightenment, bypassing the need for moral growth and communal responsibility. In a world where individualism is often celebrated above all else, Gnosticism can seem like a perfect fit. But at what cost? When spirituality becomes a solo venture, we risk losing the communal aspects of faith that bind us together, that remind us of our shared humanity. That's not to say we should shun personal spiritual growth or the quest for knowledge. Far from it. But in our pursuit of enlightenment, we must remember the importance of community, of shared values and shared truths. So, while Gnosticism may be alive and kicking in our modern society, it's important to recognize its influence and understand its implications. It's not about fear, but about awareness. Awareness of where our beliefs come from, of how they shape us, and of the potential impact they have on our society. Gnosticism may be ancient, but it's far from extinct. You may be asking, why should I care about this ancient heresy? Well, my friend, grasping the nature of Gnosticism isn't just about delving deep into historical theology, it's about learning to discern truth from deception in religious teachings, a skill that's as relevant today as it was 2000 years ago. Gnosticism, with its emphasis on special knowledge and spiritual elitism, can be seen as an early form of religious fake news. Its teachings weren't just different interpretations of Christian doctrine, but rather distortions of the truth. And these distortions, they can still be found today lurking in the corners of contemporary spiritual thought. Understanding Gnosticism can give us a kind of theological litmus test. It allows us to identify when spiritual teachings veer into the territory of elitism and exclusivity, or when they promote a dualistic worldview that separates the spiritual from the material world. It helps us to recognize when a teaching is elevating knowledge over faith, or when it's suggesting that salvation is a matter of being in the know, rather than a gift of grace. It's also a reminder of the importance of humility in our spiritual journey. Gnosticism, with its promise of secret knowledge and spiritual superiority, can be alluring. It can feed into our ego, our desire to be special, to be more enlightened than others. But the Christian faith calls us to a different path, one of humility, of recognizing our dependence on God's grace, and of seeking to love and serve others rather than striving to rise above them. Moreover, understanding Gnosticism can make us more compassionate and patient with others who may be caught up in similar deceptions. It reminds us that the allure of secret knowledge is a powerful one, and that we too could easily fall prey to it if we're not vigilant. It encourages us to approach such individuals with understanding and compassion rather than condemnation. Finally, understanding Gnosticism can deepen our appreciation for the core tenets of our faith. It reminds us that Christian teachings aren't just a set of abstract doctrines, but a response to specific distortions and misunderstandings. It helps us to see the wisdom and beauty in these teachings, and to appreciate the courage and discernment of those early Christians who stood firm against Gnostic influences. So why should you care about Gnosticism? Because it's not just a relic of the past, but a mirror that reflects back to us the challenges and temptations of our spiritual journey. It's a tool that can help us discern truth from deception, grow in humility and compassion, and deepen our appreciation for our faith. Knowing about Gnosticism isn't just for theology nerds, it's essential for all believers. Gnosticism might seem harmless, but it carries a dangerous message. You see, Gnosticism is often characterized by a stark duality between the spiritual and material worlds. It presents the material world as inherently evil and the spiritual world as inherently good. This belief system, as appealing as it may sound to some, is fundamentally flawed and, more importantly, heretical, according to traditional Christian doctrine. To understand why, let's start with the concept of God's goodness. Christianity teaches that God is the creator of all things, both the spiritual and physical realms. Everything he created, he declared as good. The book of Genesis even tells us that after God created the world, he looked at everything and saw that it was very good. However, Gnosticism contradicts this. It promotes the idea that the physical world is not just flawed, but inherently evil, a prison for the spiritual self. And if the physical world is evil, then what does that say about its creator? Gnosticism, by its very nature, denies the essential goodness of God. 
And that's not the only area where Gnosticism veers off course. It also downplays Christ's humanity. The Gnostic Jesus is seen primarily as a spiritual being, a divine messenger who brought the secret knowledge necessary for salvation. His humanity, his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, all these are dismissed as irrelevant, even illusory. Now, why should this matter to us? Well, the problem is, if we deny the humanity of Christ, we are denying the very foundation of Christianity. The doctrine of the incarnation, that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, is central to Christian faith. The Apostle John warns us about those who deny that Jesus came in the flesh, calling them deceivers and antichrists. A Jesus who is not fully human cannot fully reveal God to us. A Jesus who did not truly suffer and die cannot truly save us from our sins. A Jesus who did not physically rise from the grave cannot assure us of our own resurrection. The Gnostic Jesus is, in essence, a different Jesus, a distorted image that robs us of the true Savior and his saving work. But how does this impact the modern church and society as a whole? In the church, the influence of Gnostic thinking can lead to a devaluation of the physical aspects of our faith, such as the sacraments, the community, and the physical act of helping others. It can also lead to a spiritual elitism, a notion that some Christians are superior because they possess a higher, secret knowledge. This is far from the message of unity and equality that we find in the New Testament. In society, Gnostic ideas can contribute to a culture of escapism, a desire to disengage from the world and its problems. It can foster a disdain for the body, leading to harmful attitudes and behaviors towards health, sexuality, and the environment. It can also promote a sense of isolation and alienation as people seek to disconnect from the physical world and retreat into their own spiritual bubble. The danger of Gnosticism, then, is not just in its heretical teachings, but also in its potential to distort our understanding of God, of Christ, of ourselves, and of the world around us. It can lead us away from the truth of the gospel and into a maze of deceptive and destructive beliefs. So, while Gnosticism may seem like an ancient heresy long dead and buried, its echoes can still be heard today. Its ideas can still seep into our thinking, subtly influencing our beliefs and behaviors. That's why it's important for us to recognize and reject Gnostic thinking, to guard ourselves and our faith against its insidious influence. Gnosticism isn't just a historical curiosity, it's a serious threat to Christian orthodoxy. And as Christians, it's our responsibility to stand firm in the truth, to hold fast to the faith once delivered to the saints, and to proclaim the goodness of God and the humanity of Christ in a world that desperately needs to hear it. We've journeyed through the history of Gnosticism, but our exploration doesn't have to end here. This winding path of knowledge and understanding is one that continues to unfurl with each step we take. It's a pilgrimage, and like all pilgrimages, it's as much about the journey as it is about the destination. Christian history and theology are vast landscapes filled with towering peaks of revelation and deep valleys of inquiry. They're territories that offer endless opportunities for exploration and discovery. Gnosticism, as we've learned, is but one of the many facets that make up this intricate tapestry. To truly appreciate and grasp the depth of our faith, it's important to keep digging, to keep probing, and to keep questioning. As the Apostle Paul exhorts us in his letter to the Thessalonians, test everything, hold on to what is good. And so I invite you to join me in this ongoing quest for truth and understanding. Let's continue to delve into the mysteries of our faith together. You can follow me on Instagram at Christianity.Unmasked, where I share snippets of Christian history, theology, and thought-provoking questions. For a more in-depth discussion, you can join the conversation on Twitter at Christiani82002, and of course on Facebook and YouTube at Christianity Unmasked. I delve into a wide range of topics related to Christian faith and history. Each platform offers a different perspective, a different piece of the puzzle, and together they provide a comprehensive view of the faith we hold dear. So come, let's continue this journey together. Let's continue to question, to learn, to grow. Let's continue to explore the vast and fascinating world of Christian history and theology. Remember, in the quest for truth, knowledge is your best weapon. Until next time, keep questioning, keep learning, and keep the faith. Keep 